So why have we gathered in Denver, Atlanta, Seattle, in places across Europe, Australia, and now these two days in Chicago? Why are we here? What is the work of the One Project? In a sentence, I believe we have been called to help build a bell, a bell. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 23, the apostle writes, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Paul introduces three possible ways, Christ, Jews, and Gentiles. Let's take them in reverse order. First, Gentiles. Our apostle is not making an ethnic statement, but rather one of theology, of philosophy, the way of the Gentiles, the means of the Greco-Roman world, perhaps best understood through the Greek party, the Roman orgy, first introduced by Alexander the Great. A few years back, some Hollywood types threw a party themed a Roman orgy. Here are the many courses of the meal. Pheasants, roasted suckling pigs, plenty chicken served in nests, chilled lobster, cold lamb in a bouquet of fresh mint, peacock, turbo, silver salmon poached in wine, truffle stuffed quail, trout blue, scotch salmon rolled with caviar, ham served with ripe figs, a filet of beef with a sauce of red wine, young ducklings, chickens and game hens, a steaming shellfish in wine and cream, a wide selection of hors d'oeuvres, vegetables, dessert courses, serving maidens were dressed in Roman togas, there were live slaves carrying in the food, and while everyone drunk, until they were drunk, a lion was led around the room. And historians of antiquity say they got it right. These events were marked by excessive eating of the most exotic foods until there was commonly sickness and vomiting was a part of these affairs. It was expected that one would become publicly drunk. In fact, the water fountains were filled with wine. The behavior was deplorable. Dirty jokes, fistfights, and role-playing among the darkest possible themes. And then there was sex, the abuse of slaves, prostitutes engaged in their craft, sex everywhere, uncommitted, and the rape of young boys. The more exotic, the better. They were into anything and everything. So what does this have to do with us? A few months ago, I was walking through my house, came into the kitchen, witnessed something I had never seen before, and so I took this picture. Our not-yet-two-year-old, William, had parked his tricycle, opened a drawer, and decided this was a fine place to play. You see, William is into anything and everything. Glue, marshmallows, cell phones, sometimes in that combination. (laughs) Emptying a closet in a minute, he will eat cookies without end until he is sick. He is uncontrollable, anything and everything. And so his mother and I invest a lot of time trying to control him with locks and bars, hiding things in places he cannot see them, and spelling out the word cookie so he doesn't know what we're talking about. But we have a problem. You see, our little boy is growing up an American boy. He is living in a culture that's into anything and everything. I think an apt phrase, a theology for this land, I saw walking out of a Seattle store not long ago. It simply read, see you soon, shopping genius. Shopping, genius. To consume is to be smart. And so we find ourselves, whatever it might be, to satiate our appetite for violence, for sex, for material goods. It doesn't matter what it is. No price is too high. We will rack up whatever debt is necessary. And don't, please, don't tell us no. 
This secular consumption, this materialistic view of the world impacts the church in the 21st century, but also in the first. And so Paul writes to Christians in the capital city, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. First, the way of the Gentiles. Second, the way of the Jews. Again, Paul is not making an ethnic statement, but rather the theology, the philosophy of the religious establishment, the Pharisees of his day. And of course, the gospel record shows us a major controversy, a conflict between Jesus' vision of who God is and the nature of religion over and against that of the Pharisees. Often these disputes center around a table. We see that the Pharisees have very strict rules in their religion and social life. You do not eat with them if you're a woman, if you're too young, if you have a physical handicap, if your skin is the wrong color, if you have a certain kind of sin problem, if you do not adhere to the particulars of their cultish religion, you are out. And Jesus comes along and welcomes tax collectors and sinners. And he throws a party for 5,000 plus. He is indiscriminate in his joy. And it drives them crazy. Jesus also refuses to buy into their strict dietary codes, and they don't like it one bit. And then we find in an instance that Jesus' disciples are not washing their hands ceremonially as is required to buy into this system. And the Pharisees are coming down hard on the disciples of Jesus, pounding away, and Jesus has had enough. And in Mark chapter 7, he turns to the religious leaders and says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. There's a classic little piece of American literature. I hope you've heard it before. If not, here goes. I love it because it so well describes the contrast between the way of Jesus and the way of the Pharisees. True story written by an American journalist. She says, Last week, I took my children to a restaurant. My six-year-old son asked if he could say grace. As we bowed our heads, he said, God is good, God is great, thank you for the food, and I would thank you even more if mom gets us ice cream for dessert. And liberty and justice for all, amen. <laughs> Along with the laughter from the other customers nearby, I heard a woman remark, that's what's wrong with this country. Kids today don't even know how to pray. Asking God for ice cream, why I never. Hearing this, my son burst into tears and asked me, did I do it wrong? Is God mad at me? As I held him and assured him that he had done a terrific job and God was certainly not mad at him, an elderly gentleman approached the table. He winked at my son and said, I happen to know that God thought that was a great prayer. Really, my son asked. Cross my heart, the man replied. Then in a theatrical whisper, he added, indicating the woman's whose, woman whose remark had started this whole thing, too bad she never asked God for ice cream. <laughs> a little ice cream is good for the soul sometimes. Naturally, I bought my kids ice cream at the end of the meal. My son stared at his for a moment and then did something I will remember for the rest of my life. He picked up his Sunday and without a word, walked over and placed it in front of the woman. With a big smile, he said, here, this is for you. Ice cream is good for the soul sometimes. <laughs> and my soul is already good. <laughs> Kids today don't even know how to pray. 
The way of the Pharisees first is arrogant. My view of religion is superior to all others. Second, it is narrow. A very tiny range of acceptability. And so it is brittle, it is inflexible, and it is driven by human commands that the scriptures do not support and Jesus never advocates. But the combination of arrogance and narrowness leads, finally, to abuse. In this story, a little boy seeking communion with his father is reduced to tears because of a Pharisee. And Jesus says to the religious leaders of his day, why are you putting such heavy burdens on people? You're destroying their vision of God. You're ruining their religion. And so in John chapter 10 and verse 16, to the Pharisees, Jesus Jesus says, you have to understand, I have sheep of other folds. It's not just about you and your little group, Pharisees. There's a lot more out there that God is doing. The way of the Gentiles, the way of the Jews, before we finally move to the third way, an observation. And I believe this sets the context for the work of the One Project. We live in a polarized age. We see this in American politics. Increasingly more strident voices on right and left, more and more extreme, fighting with one another. But the church has swallowed the spirit of the age, even the tradition that many of us share. You see, the problem, it seems to me, is that on the one hand, you have the into anything and everything model of 21st century Romans. Undeniably, the secularization of the church on the one side. Don't tell us no ever. Don't be so old-fashioned. Leave us alone. Be enlightened. And on the other side, perhaps a well-meaning reaction, but a narrow fundamentalism that says, if you don't adhere to this brand of Christianity, you're nothing but a Roman. And we have learned in our culture to love the most strident black and white voices. In the media, in blogs, in magazine articles, All of the attention seems to be given those who are shouting the loudest at the very fringes of reality. Now, my worry is that Jesus gets lost in all of this. And so you have this big well curve with intention on the left and attention to the right, yelling at each other. But where is Jesus? You see, I wonder if the One Project, among many other people, could do this bold thing, turn it upside down, and create a bell, a bell curve, where Jesus is at the center of all things, where he receives all of the attention, and both Pharisees and Romans are welcomed into his fellowship. Imagine it. But hear me clearly, this is not to become a moderate. This is not to figure out where the extremes are and then to discover some middle point that seeks to keep everyone happy. For Jesus defines the geography of God and all other things are judged by him. The incarnation, Jesus Christ, speaks to us of history and the future. North, south, east, and west, our morality, our ethics, our vision of community, our understanding of all creation. There is not a single issue, not a subject that is not in submission to the incarnation of Jesus Christ, for in him we understand all things. Jesus is the absolute center. But then we must be alert. Paul does this in our verse. 
you see the Romans, the Gentiles, say to Jesus and his cross, foolishness, too restrictive, too much sacrifice. Get with the program. You're nothing but a Pharisee. Too narrow, Jesus. And on the other side, the Jews, Jesus, you're a stumbling block. You're nothing but a Roman in sheep's clothing. You're a liberal permissive. You are a sellout to real religion. And so Jesus got shot at from both sides. And all who dare follow him will get shot at from both sides. But there is a third way, a beautiful way. And over the next two days, we will hear from the stage from women and men. And you will hear from one another around these tables as we Reflect on just Jesus. What does it mean to follow this third way? Perhaps we can begin with this, a story. I grew up with a friend named Tim. And Tim and I had a lot in common. There were three boys in his family, three boys in my family. Each of us were the oldest of three. Our families did a lot together. We had so much in common. But in this way, Tim and I differed. While my body was developing normally, something inside his was amiss. And at the age of three, his mom and dad took him to the doctors to learn. Their little boy had been born with muscular dystrophy. His muscles would slowly atrophy, resulting in a compromised life and a premature death. Tim would not play the games that other little boys played. He would not be able to dream other dreams that other little boys dreamt. The age of nine, his parents realized that his weakened walking condition would soon leave him in a position where he would no longer be able to walk. He would be bound in a wheelchair. And so they went to him and said, Tim, what is your one wish, your one dream. And he said, Mom and Dad, I want to walk. I want to walk where Jesus walked. And so a trip was planned to the Holy Land, and Tim, in some of the final steps of his life, walked the streets of Jerusalem, walked the hillside of Judea. He walked where Jesus walked. But more than that, Tim walked as Jesus walked. Everyone who knew him saw this incredible affection for Jesus. In college, we had to help him with everything. Bathing, feeding, going to the bathroom, opening his textbook, turning pages. He and I were both history majors, and so we often on the same schedule would go to class, and I would load up his textbooks, and in a heavy Tennessee rain, would try to cover him in his wheelchair to keep the water off. But I will never forget the image, sitting at the side of the classroom, pants soaked in water where I wasn't able to cover it completely, water dripping onto the floor. But Tim in college again, a reputation Someone who just loved Jesus. And so 20 years ago, this spring, Tim elected our senior class president, delivered an address on Commencement Sunday. And I wish to read to you, as you look at a picture of him giving that address, some of his words. Today, he said, We have gathered to celebrate an academic milestone. Our education has been more than the teachings of Plato, understanding the structure of DNA, mastering Keynesian economics, playing the music of Beethoven, or studying the teachings of Ellen G. White. The uniqueness, the uniqueness of our education here has been the emphasis on our relationship to Jesus Christ. The key to success in that relationship In my own life, yes, he has turned sorrow into joy, weakness into strength, and pain into comfort. And then he concluded with these words, today, we should not say goodbye 
But see you later, because we know there is another time and another place waiting for us. And yes, less than a year later, Tim's body would succumb to the grave. One wish to walk where Jesus walked, to walk as Jesus walked. Oh, I want this for my life, but I must confess, too often I run like a Roman, I march like a Pharisee, but oh, to dance like Jesus. And I so wish it for my church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, which I love. Oh, by the power of his spirit, may we gain the gate of Christ. Amen. I think we can all say amen to that again. Uh, Alex, we want to thank you for that word, message in due season. Uh, this year we're doing something different. We're uh, taking a few minutes after each presentation to ask the presenter a few questions. Uh, and so that's what the, that number is about, that 707 number that should be popping up on the screen here in a few seconds, as well as the response email. While you're hearing the, each presenter speak, you may hear something that resonates with your heart, or there may be something that you know, challenges you. We'd love for you to take an opportunity in real time to respond and ask a question, and right after they're finished, we'll take an opportunity and ask them the question. So as I was listening, the first thing that came to my mind is, uh, when is your son going to be speaking at, the, at, at one project? Oh. <laughs> well, first he has to learn a few things. He prays. Um, we ask him to pray before he eats, and he's pretty good at it, but his, his prayer is, uh, Dear Jesus, thank you for the food, amen. And he says right. it that quick, and then right. he's just eating really fast. Right. So he's, he's got to learn a little bit about his consumption problem, and then we'll, and then we'll, <laughs> we'll get him here. We'll get him to speak, <laughs> yeah. right, right. And he's got to start paying for his own diapers. If he gets past those two, then we'll, then we'll talk. <laughs> well, good stuff, man. You know, uh, uh, there's something that really resonated with me as you were speaking, and that is this. Uh, you were talking about the Pharisees and the Romans, and, and the fact of the matter is we, we, have, we all have the tendency to separate into our camps, to be in places where we feel accepted, where we're not challenged with our thoughts, but everybody thinks the way that we think. We have that tendency to separate in those camps. So what would it look like for our church? Uh, how would it change the discourse to turn the bell curve around and, and allow Jesus to be the center? What it, how, how, would, how would that feel, and how would it change our current discourse? Well, I guess it begins by uh, listening to one another. Um, I think, uh, again, I think that the church really is just reflecting the broader culture, and we love to turn on the news and either hear from the far right or the far left, and I think uh, to actually be able to listen in conversation, and I think, I mean, we need to hear from both sides, because is it not true that there's some things we wish to conserve, and there's some things that we wish to liberate? You, you, you know, both sides have something to say, and I think we, we're, we're good at talking, but we're, David, but I'm not so sure that any of us, and I'm pointing at myself first, I'm not so good at listening, and I think maybe if we would make a commitment just to listening, that would change the culture. And by listening, what could we gain that we're currently not gaining right now? Well, I think we would gain a, a much richer community, for starters, mm -hmm. um, because we would be much more open to... Uh, other voices, brothers and sisters in the church, but I think we'd become a wiser church, mm. you know. Mm. Uh, I, this is hard to do, and someone told me years ago I needed to do this, but it's hard to warm to the idea that um, you need to listen to your critics, you know, even when they say things that seem completely nuts, that there's something to learn from that. And I think that if we each took the posture that maybe I should learn from the person that completely disagrees with me, it begins to change, I think, relationship and community in the church, I, I suspect. 
I believe so. And I, and I think, uh, Alex, folks are getting the uh, idea now. I'm getting a ton of Google uh, messages here. But here's what we're going to do. We invite you to continue uh, sending those questions in, um, and we will... Uh, we will make sure that we get them in during our next session because we're just out of time. We want to give folks opportunity to yes. to recalibrate and discuss. You you got you got away with it easy this time, but we'll uh, we'll make sure that we uh, are a little bit tougher with the rest of uh, the presenters. <laughs> well, listen, we want to give you an opportunity to or recalibrate, to ask questions. You have facilitators who are sitting at your table. Um, so please take an opportunity right now and let's keep this conversation going and see where God will lead us, where Jesus will lead us as we digest and process what we've just heard. Thanks so much, everybody.